Thanks, Chuck, for the opportunity. Um, I uh, am scientific advisor to a few companies. I founded a company, B9. It's a shell right now. It doesn't make any money. So really no direct conflicts for this uh, particular talk. So just to remind you the debate format here, uh, off limits is anything about uh, technical benefits uh, of robotic or laparoscopic whipples. Uh, uh, off limits is discussion of whether they're comparable in terms of safety or uh, effectiveness. So I think that's, all those are their own animal, but we're, we're off limits in terms of the debate for that. And we're just gonna compare costs and, and talk about economic viability or feasibility. So this is why no one will win this debate today. Um, there's no cost data for MIS robotic Whipple to date. Uh, I, I pulled the leaders in this field, and I wouldn't put myself in the upper echelon, but it's, uh, uh, but really this data is forthcoming, and, and I hope, uh, I know I saw Herb Zay in the audience, I'm hoping that the Pittsburgh and Cleveland groups and Mayo Clinic groups will, will have this data forthcoming soon. Uh, essentially, what we're dealing with in, in the literature is highly selected surgical case series, no level one data. Some of you may know who this is. Um, I really didn't, uh, but in preparing for this talk, uh, this is Eric Mui. Uh, and Eric did the uh, first laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And he presented his findings in 1986 to the German Surgical Society and he was severely derided and criticized. I couldn't even put on this slide some of the things that were said about him. So dialing forward in 1992, uh, uh, Shermer did a cost effectiveness study looking at laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And as you can see, the operative costs are significantly more uh, than open cholecystectomy. But if you look further into the total costs, the hospital costs are actually substantially less, and that's predominantly because the length of stay is less for laparoscopic cholecystectomy than open cholecystectomy. And so the total costs end up being uh, less for laparoscopic cholecystectomy, although it didn't achieve statistical significance. There were subsequent studies, uh, such as this one by Jeff Peters, uh, presented at the American uh, in terms of uh, uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy actually being uh, significantly less in terms of overall cost. So Eric really didn't get recognized uh, uh, for a while. Uh, in 1992, ultimately, the, the society that scoffed him gave him their highest honor. Uh, and in 1999, Sages recognized him uh, when he gave the Carl Storz lecture. So there's lots of examples of this in the literature. Um, and I'm not going to present all of them, but here's a, a nice paper from uh, 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 Birmingham uh, in 2003 about uh, MIS adrenalectomy and splenectomy. And essentially the salient points here are the MIS group had significantly longer operative times and OR recovery room charges. And the length of stay and the total charges for patients undergoing the MIS approach were significantly less. So again, it's just a recurring theme and it'll be a recurring theme throughout. So here's a paper published uh, by the uh, Indiana group. Uh, Josh Waters, one of our surgical residents, worked with hospital administration to look into costs of uh, distal pancreatectomy. So essentially we did 77 distal pancreatectomies in 2009. Uh, we looked at that consecutive series uh, and uh, essentially uh, looked at both uh, uh, open robotic as well as laparoscopic and essentially the conclusions were the robotic group had significantly longer operative times by about an hour and intraoperative costs almost by double when you adjusted for amortization of the robot and service contracts. But the length of stay and the total cost for the patient undergoing the robotic approach were statistically equivalent uh, and nominally were actually less. And all this data accounted for amortization of the robot capital equipment costs and service contracts, which uh, for those doing uh, many invasive Whipple procedures, I would, I would recommend when you do do your cost studies to be sure to include that information. So it's no great surprise that the threats to the viability, economic viability and feasibility for 
minimally invasive Whipple or the extreme robotic Whipple, which is associated with even more costs, is equipment costs and operative time. So what I'd like to do is take you through sort of step by step uh, what we did with our distal pancreatectomy series and sort of look at what numbers are out there for uh, Whipple, which are very few. Uh, uh, in, in these next few slides. So looking at equipment costs uh, for the distal pancreatectomy, if you see the first box on the left side, essentially the operative adjusted cost uh, is $6,214. Uh, that's just intraoperative when you adjust. That's the amortization service contracts for the capital equipment, that sort of thing. Now, <clears throat> if you compare that to open and laparoscopic, it's, it's about uh, uh, twice that. Now, the only reference that I could find on minimally invasive Whipple, a robotic Whipple, in this case, uh, was from Baghi, uh, uh, from Italy. It was pu published in the British Journal of Surgery in 2013. And essentially, uh, it was about 6,400 euros more intraoperative costs than, um, uh, than an open uh, case. Not, not a case match study, but it was, it was just when they looked at their uh, cost data. It wasn't, wasn't very detailed either. So that's about $10,000 uh, in terms of um, uh, excess uh, operative cost. Now on the, on the flip side, the intraoperative time uh, for a distal pancreatectomy, you can see the open uh, approach uh, was an hour less than the robotic approach. That was statistically significant. Uh, and when you look at uh, Whipple series, minimally invasive Whipple series, essentially the the operative time is uh, anywhere from two to three hours longer on average for, for some of the biggest series. There's somebody in Indiana that did a 23-hour robotic Whipple in the community, so I'm sure that those sorts of results aren't being published. Uh, but essentially, um, the operative time here was also statistically significantly higher for the minimally invasive uh, Whipples. So we, we looked at the, uh, the Cleveland Clinic data uh, had published a case uh, matched comparison, which I thought was the best uh, in the literature uh, in terms of looking at uh, the comparative uh, times. And then the Pittsburgh group uh, number there, the 529 numbers included as well from their recent publication. So, I mean, whenever you're presented with challenges uh, 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 or threats, uh, uh, you know, I mean, one approach is to abandon, uh, the other approach is to adapt. Uh, and so with equipment costs, uh, you know, with all due respect, we really can't, uh, with robotic, the, the extreme case, we, we can't uh, change those right now. If I mean, the marginal cost curve intersects the marginal revenue curve. I mean, essentially, they're going to have a profit in a monopoly market no matter what we do. So we can't, with... Until there's perfect competition in the robotic world, uh, when other companies enter the market uh, for, for a free competitive market, it's not going to, from a microeconomic perspective, we just can't do anything about the equipment costs. Um, but we can try to offset hospital costs uh, and then total costs. And the best way to do this is through de decreased length of stay, which I think is a product anyway of the minimally invasive approach, uh, but it, it should be enhanced. Uh, as best we can. And then operative time, I think this is just something that we have to discipline ourselves on in terms of regulating operative time. Uh, perhaps we shouldn't spend 10 to 12 hours doing a robotic Whipple, even in our learning curve. So here's some ideas that uh, we've employed, uh, some we've employed better than others uh, uh, at Indiana, uh, preoperatively in terms of patient selection, looking at anesthetic risk, frailty index, optimal anatomy. Um, Dr. Nakib's optimal anatomy is different than my optimal anatomy. Some of that, uh, he likes a, a, a firm gland with a big duct. I like a, a, an easy dissection with, uh, ends up with a small duct. So, I mean, it, it may be different for different uh, people in terms of patient preparation, um, nutritional optimization, as well as physical preconditioning, and postoperatively having an optimal care map. Eugene Seppa from our group gave a nice talk about some of the changes that we've made in terms of intending involvement, discharge coach, post-discharge calls, and then prospective monitoring uh, of your outcomes, not just patient outcomes, but your economic outcomes, and to partner with a hospital in this. In terms of regulating operative time, 
um, you know, I think we have to be more introspective uh, about this, uh, and I think otherwise we'll, we'll come under criticism. So interoperatively, I think, I think you need HBB fellowship trained attendings or the equivalent, preferably two, such as in the Pittsburgh model. Uh, they were able to work with their leadership there in surgery as well as their hospital to, to make that uh, worth their while uh, so they could build that program safely uh, and efficiently. A dedicated OR team, skilled OR assistant, and then careful adoption. Uh, first, do no harm. You know, work with step-up procedures, hybrid procedures, robotic assistic procedures. Um, set time limits and stick to the time limits. Resist pushing uh, the time limit, and you'll be able to regulate the operative time and therefore those costs. I think this is a key slide to achieving both those, however, is having an informed patient. And I think you have to be honest about your experience, not just your experience, but your institutional uh, experience. Um, be honest with your patients about the evidence. The bottom line is there's no level one data that MIS robotic Whipple is more beneficial. So why the hell are we doing it? Well, we're doing it because data from other complex procedures, including pancreatectomy procedures, indicates there are benefits. And set your patient's expectations appropriately. Tell them you're going to regulate your intraoperative time and tell them why and whether you're going to do it fully robotic, fully laparoscopic, where you're going to have a hybrid technique where you do the dissection and then make a small incision uh, and then complete the anastomosis. Just set the expectations of the patient appropriate so you can build your program in a safe way, being attentive to the intraoperative time. So just going back to the looking at pancreatectomy, distal pancreatectomy, in instituting uh, these things, the total adjusted costs for robotic pancreatectomy was $11,904, which was actually nominally less than the open and laparoscopic costs in our uh, 2009 series of 77 patients. Statistically, it was not significant, uh, but at least it keeps that above reproach in terms of, uh, uh, of a technique that's uh, economically viable. Now, granted, you know, there's a selection bias here, uh, and, uh, but I don't think it's all selection. Um, for instance, if you look at the length of stay numbers for the Whipple operation, which is the, the, the uh, furthest down on the slide, the box uh, looking at uh, 13 days for open and 10 for robotic, I mean, that was a case match comparison uh, from the Cleveland group. So I don't think that's just uh, patient selection. Uh, I think this is uh, uh, a true phenomenon. So what about the future? So equipment costs in the future will be less uh, uh, due to market competition. It's coming. Uh, and operative time, I think it's re this really on our shoulders to uh, regulate the operative time. And also there was a beautiful talk given uh, Thursday night about, uh, uh, about education in terms of advanced uh, uh, pancreatectomy, uh, minimally invasive robotic pancreatectomy. And I think involving the uh, uh, residents and fellows more in a very structured uh, learning environment uh, with simulation as well as uh, uh, um, involvement with this, I think, is, is going to be key for the future. So in summary, equipment and operative time costs of minimally invasive robotic Whipple exceed open approaches, but adaptations allow the Whipple to be done this way uh, to be a viable option in today's economic environment uh, through decreased length of stay and operative time regulation. Market competition is expected to mitigate equipment costs in the future. In conclusion, uh, MIS robotic pancreatectomy and or Whipple is feasible in select patients by select pancreatic surgery teams in select centers. Today to be viable, feasible, this is a short term, it must be carefully adopted by HPB fellowship trained surgeons in institutions with a strong commitment to the surgeon and the program where patients are carefully selected, appropriately counseled, and outcomes both intra-op and post-op as well as cost are monitored. And in the future, I believe that MIS robotic Whipple will be increasingly adopted, less costly, and more efficient uh, than the open approach. Thank you. Now we invite Scott up to uh, counter that argument. Well, I'm not sure we need debate because in his conclusion slide, he said, in the future, it might be more cost effective. I'm going to go to the present. Uh, next slide set, please. Okay, so I have no disclosures uh, relative to this talk. 
Um, Chuck asked us, is this a uh, viable option today? And I would say yes, based upon the fact that there's increasing numbers of minimally invasive pancreatic duodenectomies being done around the world. Uh, it's certainly being offered increasingly to patients, so clearly it is an option. Uh, so the horse is out of the barn, so to speak. But I think it's a slow horse right now, and unlike laparoscopic cystectomy, I think it can and should be corralled. So I'm going to come at this as a different uh, perspective than what Max did. I think there's some important principles to frame the debate. First, we have to talk about the principles governing the adoption of surgical innovation, and we have to talk about those factors that influence healthcare value. So I would like to bring everybody's attention uh, to this, uh, the bulletin. This is a, a summary of Dr. Pellegrini's presidential address to the American College of Surgeons this fall, uh, where he specifically addressed this dilemma that's facing uh, the future uh, surgeon with respect to innovation and how we adopt it, uh, at the same time being ethical and moral. And he uh, highlighted a couple of issues, which I want to point out, and the one was innovation. And he says, the big challenge for us is the pace of change will accelerate even more in the future. But it's not the change, but the nature and pace of change that poses a challenge for us. And then he highlighted the importance of quality, costs, and accountability. As you all know, uh, we are increasingly uh, to be held accountable for our decisions and what the options that we pick. Uh, foremost, they must be safe, they have to be demonstrably effective, and they have to have high health care value. Dr. Pellegrini quotes Jerry Freed here, uh, where Dr. Freed also talks about some principles adopting a new technology. And these are important questions, which I think are pertinent to this debate. Does the innovation fulfill a clinical need? Does it add value to the current options? Is it financially viable, directly related to our debate? And can it be adopted by the average surgeon with relative ease? So keep those thoughts in mind. I now want to talk a little bit about healthcare value. And I would bring everybody's attention to Michael Porter's article in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, we at Virginia Mason are a big believer in healthcare value. We've sort of modified the equation. And for interest sakes, the healthcare value equation was actually first uh, described at Virginia Mason in 1986. First, any technology has to be appropriate, uh, but it has to be timely, and patients have to have access to it. If you can't get access to somebody doing an, an MIS uh, Whipple safely or in a timely manner, it has almost uh, no value to that patient. And then we have the quality, the outcomes, all this divided by cost. And what Dr. Porter uh, has pointed out is that about a third of all of our healthcare expenditures in this country can be considered waste. And so, uh, Many people have just looked for ways to uh, eliminate waste as probably the most easy and effective way to save on cost. So what's the healthcare value of MIS uh, pancreatic duodenectomy? It really depends on the perspective. Are we talking about from the patient, the surgeon, the payer, the hospital, or society? And I'll remind everybody that in an egalitarian society, decisions are made kind of weighing and balancing uh, the factors affecting the individuals and society at the same time. Some important principles are that advancements in surgery should improve management of disease by increasing survival, enhancing quality of life, or reducing costs, delivering the same type of care. New technology approaches that do not demonstrate any increased efficacy must certainly result in overall reduced costs to justify their use. Uh, minimally invasive pancreatic duodenectomy today does not satisfy either of these principles. And then, as was alluded to uh, by Pierre Clavian in, the, in his talk, is the Bally Collaborative out of Oxford. Uh, I strongly recommend uh, those who are interested in innovation to read this, and this is just uh, from the, uh, the third article published in The Lancet, and it's the asking for public registries and uh, registering clinical trials so everybody can know uh, that how we are looking at things. And I'll uh, point out that there are no registered clinical trials 
or registries on milliinvasive pancreatic duodenectomy. There actually was one listed in clinicaltrials.gov, but it was withdrawn. So we really don't know what's going on out there. Here's some facts. First MIS Whipple uh, performed by Michel Gagné in 1994. And here we are uh, 20 years later. The slow adaption by even expert HPB MIS surgeons around the world is testimony to the lack of obvious clinical benefit, the technical challenges to learn the technique, and the increased costs. Recently, expansion of MIS pancreatic duodenectomy has largely been fueled by aggressive marketing tactics by both doctors and hospitals to gain a competitive edge in attracting patients to come to their hospitals and practice. And yet they're still reimbursed, though the margins are clearly decreased. Some other facts. Reimbursement is tied to fee-for-service still today in this country, and it's unrelated to healthcare value. There's no CPT code for this operation. There's no national or international registries. And there's actually no collaboratives who are reporting on the safety cost or healthcare value of minimally invasive pancreatectomy. There's no consensus statements or expert guidelines on safety or healthcare value. And our understanding comes from published literature, which was fraught with publication bias. The disasters and deaths that we read about in the newspapers every day and the lawsuits that are occurring around the country are not being reported in the literature, at least in the medical literature. So the outcomes outside of the major centers are largely unknown and hidden from public scrutiny. There's been no comparative effectiveness research to this day in mainly invasive uh, pancreatic duodenectomy, no in-depth cost analysis reports, no reports on quality of life as an endpoint, no es estimates of quality adjusted life years gained or disability adjusted life years lost from the MIS approach. And there's one study recently published on the learning curve. Uh, Max talked about the cost drivers and they're listed here again, capital equipment, OR time, but something it didn't mention is learning curve cost, and that has to be taken into consideration in, in, in the adoption of any uh, technology. Hospital stay, of course, and also complications. And I remind you that the majority of deaths that have occurred, at least under robotic surgery in this country, have never been reported. Here's a comparison of some of the cost drivers that you heard him refer to. Uh, with respect to capital equipment for minimally invasive pancreatic duodenectomy, it's, it's a huge range depending upon whether or not you use a robot. Uh, the OR time uh, increase is also widely uh, variable. There's only one or two reports in the literature where the OR time is actually equivalent or less than an open uh, pr approach. And the length of stay, uh, again, there's only one or two reports where the length of stay is actually less compared to an open approach. Uh, complications are the same. The learning curve is, is, has been estimated to be anywhere uh, from uh, 100 or greater, and the cost of that learning curve uh, can be anywhere from $300 to $800,000 per surgeon. Uh, here's the cost analysis that Max uh, also reported. This is the only uh, in-depth analysis, and uh, they did a lot of interesting things. They looked at variable and fixed costs, but they looked at the time for individual task completion. And they also brought out, for example, the extra time that goes into just instrument exchange, which on an average was 110 minutes per case. And there's the uh, additional cost estimate when one uses a robot. Uh, this author concluded that select patients can undergo robotic pancreatic duodenectomy, but the main doubt sites are high costs and prolonged operating times. And there's, if you're going to use a robot, here's some additional costs, but I just want to point out the areas of waste that could be completely eliminated if one did not use the minimally invasive approach. And most expert surgeons who adopt this technology have a second surgeon at the bedside, not a PA. And so that's an additional cost that needs to be factored in. This is an excellent article that talks about the, the uh, dilemma of the, of the cost of robotic surgery in general in the United States um, that's worth reading, again, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, I point out that they conclude comparative effectiveness research and large-scale multicenter trials or rigorous non-randomized evaluations are needed first to determine which patients benefit from open and robot-assisted approaches. 
So what do the experts say, most of whom are in this room right now, uh, about uh, their experience with minimally invasive pancreatic duodenectomy? Uh, Mike Kendrick is off to my right, I think, and uh, I'm just highlighting those things that they've said despite their excellent uh, large volumes. However, controlled trials are needed. Uh, here's Herb Zay and uh, Jim Moser's uh, group. Larger, more mature, multi-institutional cohorts will be needed to explore potential benefits over open and laparoscopic techniques. And uh, here's their uh, most recent publication with 250 robotic pancreatic resections. This is the only paper I'm aware of that talks about the learning curve. And the thing to point here is, is that the learning curve as shown uh, by the reduction in complications occurred between 80 and 100 cases. And here's the uh, graph showing that uh, the learning curve is still got a way to go because you can see the slope of the operative time continues to improve over time, uh, but the length of time, uh, despite doing 250 robotic cases, is still greater than uh, the average for an open uh, procedure. The plateau is not reached, and so we really don't know what the learning curve is other than it's greater than 132 cases. Uh, Herb concludes that further research to evaluate and comparative effectiveness of uh, MIS platforms and open surgery is now required. Uh, here is uh, a paper just uh, from the Cleveland Clinic group showing that essentially the curves are flat over uh, their learning curve, uh, both in operative time, blood loss, and length of stay. So there's really no demonstrable improvement over time. And they uh, concluded at this point there's not enough evidence to consider it standard of care. And then uh, this paper published by uh, Peter Allen, the Memorial Group, uh, just last month, uh, it's a meta-analysis uh, for whatever data that's out there. They said that it's feasible uh, in select patients at select centers. And while there may be a benefit, the lack of randomized trials or high-quality non-randomized studies comparing both techniques do not allow for firm conclusions to be drawn. It cannot be considered superior or standard at this time. And Horatio Aspen uh, has a, one of the largest experiences in the world as well, and he concludes there's need for multi-institutional series. An increasing experience for this procedure and larger series and a registry would allow additional investigation of possible advantages for an MIS approach and have more conclusive evidence. And he adds this word of caution uh, in, an, in a response to an editorial written in, to his paper, there's been no evidence that having a robot available plays such a role and patient safety may become an issue when an attempt is made to curtail the learning process. And uh, the Kaiser system, as you know, is quite uh, bent on uh, cost effectiveness uh, and uh, lean medicine as well. And this is just a quote from one of their administrators. To date, hospitals eager to attract patients with the technology du jour have generally been willing to absorb the higher costs since it's not reimbursable associated with robotic surgery, but healthcare overhaul provisions that encourage payments for providers based on episodes of care rather than individual services may begin to change these practices. And then this editorial written in Surgical Endoscopy uh, just this fall uh, is from the Netherlands and talks about this dilemma because of the extraordinary cost of robotic surgery um, is also worth uh, reading. So in summary, almost every article uh, by credible leaders in this field over the last 10 years have concluded we need a registry we need controlled trials, or at least prospective case match series. We need survival data for cancer patients. We need to measure, report, and analyze healthcare value of the MIS approach. We need short and long-term cost data. And until this occurs, the financial viability of MIS pancreatic duodenectomy is in jeopardy and unlikely to be sustained due to decreasing hospital margins. And once again, here's an article that appeared uh, this last year in the bulletin. Uh, they again talks about the issues with respect to healthcare reform and, and uh, with respect to robotics, the cost and quality equation for value have often been at odds with actual investment in the healthcare dollar and robotic technology. I'll conclude there. Thank you very much.
So we'll, we're not going to actually do a rebuttal um, because some questions came up and might be able to field one or two from the audience, um, but we'll uh, kind of limit it. we got about 10 minutes here. So uh, to both of you, um, when will this embargo uh, lift on the competition uh, for robotics uh, in terms of uh, the monopoly from certain companies uh, dominating the market? Yeah, I mean, great question. I'm not sure. I, th I think it's going to be uh, probably close to a decade before we have a company that can actively compete with Intuitive. So it's it's not, uh, I mean, that's just my opinion. Uh, there are some uh, companies uh, in Japan that do have robots and they're working with uh, uh, various prototypes, but, uh, and, and it may be quicker, but I, I'm guessing before somebody goes head to head with Intuitive and actually you know, turns that uh, automatic profit from the capital and equipment costs into uh, a more free-flowing competitive environment, I'm, I'm guessing, a decade. That seems like a big break on, on the process. Uh, that's a long time. Uh, Scott? It depends on uh, if Intuita is able to continue to buy the patents. Uh, their patents will be expiring uh, sooner than 10 years. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that um, there are all sorts of robots sitting on the sideline right now that um, have all sorts of technology to it that will make robotic surgery uh, jump into a new era. You know, the Amadeus platform uh, in Canada, uh, to quote um, their CEO, he says, he shows a picture of, I think, the intuitive robot, but he says, we're at the Kitty Hawk stage right now. You know, most robots, uh, the modern robots, out there, Fuse, CT, ultrasound, Doppler, uh, they operate in different light spectra, infrared and the like, so you can see transparently through organs and know exactly where you're going. And, and of course, the platform is much smaller as well. So I, I think that the whole robotic uh, thing will change with the new technology. And as you said, as competition drives costs down, then we'll probably all be operating with robots in the future. So the next one, next question is about time in the OR. Uh, I've got a particular um, problem with this in that uh, I have a situation where I do Whipples and other pancreatectomies on off days, not my block day, in which I don't get started till four or five in the afternoon because there are two robotic hysterectomies at four hours a pop ahead of me. And um, it just seems like if people want to practice, they should be doing that at night uh, on their own time. Um, so my question is, uh, what about goodwill among your staff? Uh, what does the chairman think about this sort of uh, resource allocation? And along with us, Max, I was intrigued by your um, uh, topic here of intraoperative time limits. Um, are you suggesting that uh, we have a set uh, five-hour, six-hour period to do the operation? If it doesn't get done, it gets converted, and uh, is this a, uh, something It seems to me like that would be something that would put a lot of pressure on a surgeon and probably would not be a good ideal situation for a good case. What do you guys say about that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I mean, we, we uh, struggle with this in Indiana as well. I mean, I've, I've done 10-hour robotic whipples, uh, but uh, really haven't felt that uh, I was helping the patient uh, by doing that. If we could, uh, I think ultimately, um, you know, pursuing more of a, and you know, when you when you step up to the, the level of uh, that procedure, um, um, by however you do it in your practice, where you go through distal panks and then you go through HJs and then you go through uh, PJs uh, and then step up to Whipple. But I think even with the Whipple procedure, um, you know, one of the things uh, we did early on was we do the whole dissection laparoscopically or robotically, and then we just make a little mini incision and move the retractors around and do the uh, do the anastomoses. Of course, I always thought the robot would be best for the anastomoses, so that was kind of frustrating for me um, because I wanted to get to that part because that's where I thought it, it would have the most uh, benefit. Um, but I think. Uh, Really, uh, we have to be good stewards uh, of the patient's time, and I think that uh, as people adopt uh, minimally invasive Whipple, robotic Whipple, I really think we have to come up with creative ways of tracking the time, 
making sure we limit the time. Um, and I mean, if, if I've not progressed uh, to complete the resection in three hours, uh, minimally invasively, we should be opening, I think. Uh, and that's just, uh, that's from doing it and, and not following those guidelines to now doing it and following those guidelines. Scott? Well, first let me say I am not against MIS pancreatectomy, uh, but specifically to in this thing, it, it, the question was, is a viable option in today's economic climate? I strongly endorse uh, the champions in this room, these two guys standing over there, um, that are going to show us how to do it. What I think, in answer to your question, is that if you're going to take on something so challenging, you have to be totally committed to it. And it's just not the surgeon. It's the, it's the healthcare system and the hospital has to support the infrastructure. There shouldn't be anybody bickering, uh, no offense, uh, Chuck, about getting into the OR because I think it's a hospital and a, and a system issue. And I think that until uh, the times come down, the technique is worked out better and the safety is clearly shown, uh, that there should be select centers by select surgeons only uh, defining uh, the approach, and then it can start to be disseminated after that. Um, but perhaps these two yeah. guys standing over there to the right uh, can talk about their learning experience and how they, because their hospitals clearly had to open up the doors to allow them to take on these endeavors. Of course, there's the whole concept of, efi of efficiencies of scale. And the places that are doing this are going to um, leap ahead by efficiency uh, purposes. But you know, this is bleeding out into community hospital situations, and I don't see that that's going to be able to happen the way you describe it. There, uh, I'd be a fool not to take uh, uh, some comments from the audience here with these august people waiting. So Henry, Henry, Henry Pitt. Uh, so to Scott's point, we actually have a national registry. Uh, it began uh, in November of 2011, and through the pancreatectomy demonstration project, uh, we, uh, for uh, 13 months, kept track of all the minimally invasive Whipples at 43 institutions. I can tell you only about 7% of them were done minimally invasively, and the outcomes don't look very good in 2012 nationally. We're going to present all that later this year, so I'm not going to say anything more. Through ACS NISQIP in all of 2013, uh, all the data on minimally invasive Whipples that were done at 100 institutions nationally are currently in the database and will be actually available to everybody who participates in ACS NISQIP in their participant use file later this year. So we have a great registry. We're going to have to look at the data very carefully. But, and I agree, Henry. And, and it we have to, Cleveland Clinic and Mayo Clinic in that. We, we have to start somewhere, but what I'm talking about is a national registry. That does, the, the, uh, the people that participate in NISQIP are interested in driving quality. You're not going to be seeing the disasters in the community in your registry. There are. I, I can tell you there are a lot of disasters in this registry. Well, I understand that, but <laughs> there are even more in the community. There are many deaths uh, of people. Uh, out in the community that aren't HPB surgeons and they think they've got a robot and they go out there and they start to do, you know, they think, oh, I got a robot now, so now I can do this Whipple even better, you know. There are a lot of deaths out there. You read about them in the newspapers or in the legal uh, journals and the like. Uh, these are not in the medical literature. Well, this, all of this will get into the medical literature. Okay, we have a few minutes left. Let's go to Mike. So just a comment for those who are feeling a little down, if you were excited about MIS before this, I would just say that the future is bright, and I think that the, the two speakers should be congratulated, because I completely agree with both of them, actually. Um, I think that there is a lot of concern about what the cost will mean in today's environment, but I will remind people that even the cost evaluations that we have to date for just about anything really do not really address the whole issue. And for an example, even the little bit of data we have for MIS Whipple um, or even distal pancreatectomy, it still doesn't look at the bigger picture. Uh, we're going to present some data showing that patients are more likely to get to their adjuvant chemotherapy. They're going to have a better progression-free survival. And when you look at operative time and hospital costs, you completely miss that. The reasons why some of the patients in our open series missed adjuvant therapy were because of terrible wound infections and things like that that are costly to take care of that are never considered. 
So if we're just looking at costs, we need to stay tuned because there will be better data for that. As far as the registry, I think that's an important point, but I'll also remind you that uh, there are a lot of open whipples and open distals and open liver resections done in small hospitals everywhere, and we don't even understand the death rate of those. Mm -hmm. So when we're focused on one procedure, it'll be great to get the data to pick on that, but the reality is about 80 or 90 percent of what we do, we, we don't have any level one evidence for. You know, when the first Whipple was done, they were a crazy innovator, right? And those that proposed it and presented it at meetings were, were uh, questioned in terms of, is it a value to the patient and does it do good? I think what we have to do is expect that minimally invasive approaches will provide benefit, as it has in everything that's been shown, essentially, and then go from there. My question to the panel would be, what do we think, uh, what is our responsibility as surgeons to continue to um, appropriately evaluate cost and outcomes data, but still try and push forward the practice of surgery to benefit our patients. And using minimally invasive Whipple, since it's the topic, as that launching point, what do we owe the patients, regardless of the cost or the outcomes, what do we owe our patients in terms of advancing the care of patients with pancreatic disease? Thanks. A quick comment. Well, yeah. okay. clearly, clearly um, that's a need, and we wouldn't be where we are today if we didn't have the pioneers who push things. Uh, but I would, again, refer people back to the Balio Collaborative. I think uh, those three articles published in The Lancet about how we adopt and uh, uh, implement new technology is really, really both, uh, it's founded on ethical and moral principles. You know, we have to protect safety of patients, um, and as we implement new things, rather than, like I said, you're letting the horse out of the barn uh, all over the place uh, before we really know the limitations and the benefits. So I would just refer back to the Lancet articles. Okay, we have a minute or two. Can we have quick comments from both of you? Yeah, Dave Kuby from Atlanta. Um, it was a good debate, and I, I also agree with both of you. I, the, the caveat and the concern, the point of that your hospital administration has to back you is, is very important, and that's something that I have struggled with at Emory, and when I can do two Whipples and be done by three or four in the afternoon uh, easily versus one robotic Whipple where I'm probably dragging a partner in, I think that's, a, that's just a different playing field, and the administration's gonna look at that. Huge resource allocation. Everybody in the room probably has Facebook, and now Facebook puts these ads automatically on your, that will scroll through that you don't request, and how many have been seeing these ads for lawyers looking at people doing robotic HPB surgery. They have made their practices specifically on this. So when Mike and Horacio published their wonderful series, they are head and shoulders above most people. And so we have to remember that we're getting a program started. We have to be really careful. If I have a complication from an open Whipple, I've had a complication from an open Whipple. If you have one from a robotic Whipple and you're not these guys, you could be in trouble, either with your hospital or within a sort of like living donor or liver transplantation. Do you either, either you have comments on that? Exposure. No, I agree. Yeah, I oh, agree. Last comment, Horacio. Yeah, thank you. I also want to congratulate both of the <clears throat> of the debaters. Um, and on this, I want to emphasize there's no much debate. And I think for the audience, the group of us that are doing minimum invasive surgery, we have it clear. It is a very difficult thing to implement. And it's going to be in our shoulders to show not that we can shave a couple of days of the hospital stay, but that this is a better procedure that costs well and we can give value. The problem is it's going to take time because of the complexity of the procedure. One point I wanted to make is we did publish, not a large series, but we did publish 75 patients against 48, 75 laparoscopically, and it's published in surgical endoscopy with the title Cost Analysis of Open and Laparoscopic Pancreatic Duodenectomy. Then it is not level one, but it is a comparative study, and we did prove what you all were guessing, that basically the cost is the same for the minimum invasive surgery laparoscopic pancreatic duodenectomy with the open because the compensated expenses on the operating room are compensated by the hospital charges. And we went by nursing expenses, laboratory expenses, and all of those that were hospital and were much less on the laparoscopic, and the cost was, was the same. Then my question to you is, it's a little bit on what Mike was saying. Why don't we take this opportunity that the focus is so much on MIS, pancreatic or duodenectomy, and we do also what Henry was said, and try to look for all of those things that Scott has mentioned in terms of quality of life of these patients, prospective studies, and we try to look into the open group too at the same time. Do you think that that is feasible? 
Yeah, and I think it's a great opportunity for this association <laughs> to really get behind, and you know, all of you who are the leaders in the MIS pancreatectomy are in the room. What a great opportunity for you to get together and maybe draft a proposal that this association could get behind. You know, I would love to see uh, some type of a consensus conference uh, about where we, how we should go about doing it. So, it's easy to match them. The registry has all the open procedures and we can match them. So we'll end on that. I think that's exactly the point, uh, Scott, is hopefully the purpose of this debate and bringing it to you is to stimulate some progress in the future. You have all these people in the room with great minds. There's a huge opportunity to figure this out coming up and I hope you guys work together on that. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you.